Good afternoon. Welcome to um, our session, Shrinking Space for Non-Governmental Actors. Uh, they've been called many different names, not just NGOs, CSOs, non-profit, third party, faith-based communities, uh, faith-based organizations, community-based organizations, etc. Their altruistic mo motivation often challenged with many questioning their motives. They have been accused of advancing certain ideological leanings, ranging from the neoliberal agenda to certain religious dogmas. Some accused them of being interested only in showcase projects rather than deep-rooted sustainable impact. Yet in many difficult times, we have witnessed that non-governmental actors enjoy a better standing in the society than governments due to the role they play in helping to create a better governance of the society. Delivering service in healthcare, to assisting in the provision of humanitarian assistance, advocating for basic human rights, to saving the planet from human's destruction. CSOs and NGOs rose up time and again in facing the challenge of our times. Political uprising, disaster response, humanitarian conflict, saw civil society filling up the space when government failed the function. The economic contribution is not to be underestimated either, with nonprofit organizations account for 5 to 10 percent of GDP in most OECD countries. However, in recent years, we have seen a diminishing space for NGOs, with suppressions that are designed to limit their movements, restrictions that range from curtailing the freedom of expression to physical intimidation and attack to some forms of legislation to limit the movements, measures that hinder cross-border funding and grant making, to closing off physical access to certain areas. Quite surprisingly, the closing of the space are not done only by rogue states and authoritarian regimes, but also to the settings of liberal democracies. Not only done by government actors, but also by non-government players, such as right-wing groups and corporations bent to make money using unscrupulous methods. To discuss these situations and how to move forward in creating an enabling environment in which the NGOs can thrive again, we have with us five distinguished speakers, not only with great knowledge on the issues, but also extensive experience in fighting off these worrisome tendencies. We've got Mr. Leonard Sal, uh, Ms. Tini Soni, Mr. Mo Ibrahim, uh, Mr. Patrick Gaspard and Mr. Antoine Sire. Please, uh, I would like to invite you all to give uh, a round of applause for our wonderful speakers. <laughs> I'm going to start with uh, uh, Mr. Leonard. Uh, you're going to present us your project, uh, which you say will uh, could be a solution for the, uh, the NGO worlds. Uh, I think uh, I'm not going to deliberate more on that. I was just going to leave you to, uh, to present us with the project, please. Th thank you very much. Um, when I was at school, they used to score my, sc sc score my school report A to F. But there was a second box, and that was for effort. And I used to score really well for efforts. I didn't always get the A grades that I wanted, but I scored really well for effort. And persistence in our sector has brought us here today, brought me here today with this project. And it's a very simple idea, but it has taken a lot of persistence and effort to get that here today, even with a very simple idea. So thank you very much for, for listening. So, in brief, although there are some rating agencies for nonprofits, especially in the US, believe it or not, there is no common international and independent standard for the charity sector. For such a big, growing, and critically important sector for our future, and bearing in mind the pressure it's under, that's crazy. Our project's therefore very simple to champion the development of an international and independent voluntary code of practice for the sector, and that's work now in progress and being published late next year. It will be followed up, we hope, by the introduction of a more rigorous international standard, an ISO, 
the same kind of good business, the, the same kind of standard that good businesses seek to achieve and that allows them to stand tall in their own fields. And these standards, we hope, will be a leap forward. Consider the benefits for charities and non-profits that will then be able to show actual impact and true accountability to their beneficiaries. Those organisations that embrace a simple roadmap to better practice will have the opportunity to rebuild trust and grow the funding pot, raising more money from funders of all types who will then have the confidence in how their money is being used to positively impact society and improve lives. In short, we want these very simple new standards to help the sector to give better, to do better and to be more impactful. The initial code we've scoped will be international multi-language, very important, English, French, Spanish, Mandarin, Arabic, Hindi and Urdu, independent and accessible to all non-profits, small to large. It's a light-touch blueprint for better accountability. Now, the scope itself will include one, governance, two, transparency, three, measurement of impact, and we know that's not easy in this sector. But not everything that can be counted counts, but it's very important to win hearts and minds that people show impact. We want to measure what's important. Unlike many of the rating agencies, we don't really want to measure inputs and outputs. We really want to measure outcomes and impacts. So we don't want to measure uh, the number of wells. We actually want to measure whether the wells work, whether there are clean water coming out of the wells, and whether the villagers benefit. The fourth thing is, to, to really fund for impact, you must be clear and close to the problem. So a key part of our scope is to bring beneficiaries into the very heart of the conversation. And in fact, th this sits at, uh, as the core of what we're doing. Beneficiaries are often uh, given what we think they need rather than what they actually want. And we want the code to ensure that we're accountable to those we really want to help. It's a bottom-up approach, which we think is crucial. Although my co-author and I have given birth to this initiative, and we have scoped the elements that want, we want to be included, the, the new code's moving into a space that's truly independent and international, because it's being independently chaired by British standards. BSI develops and accredits international standards across a huge range of sectors, and it's also a member organisation of ISO, the International Standards Organisation in Geneva. The ability to be truly international and multilingual is key, because any measurement systems in our field tend to be country-focused, so our approach goes beyond national silos. Also key is independence, which flows down from working with the globally credible standards accreditation body. We realized very early on that to be credible, it had to be independent, independent of any organization, any country, and any sector. It's so difficult for, for, for any organization in the NGO sector to collaborate because everybody is competing for face time and for funding. But sector collaboration there is because in terms of the British standards process, which is chairing and, and managing the project now, there will be an independent international steering committee and it will be drawn widely from, from the sector. And at each draft of the code of practice, it will be shared ever more widely with the international sector for collaboration and feedback. So it's really coming from the sector for the sector. It will be co-created by many experts, not me, before being finally published in print and online. It's, it's a first step. This is a voluntary code. Nobody's going to be forced to do this. It's not a legal requirement. It's not a, cumbr it's not a cumbersome set of rules. It's just a way to do things in a better way to be more efficient and more considered. We want the work to be meaningful and accessible, not a long box-ticking exercise. It won't layer complexity, workload, or cost on charities. We're determined for it to help them and donors to make informed decisions, especially for beneficiaries. It's there to make a difference. Because uh, British Standards are a member of ISO, we hope that the voluntary code will quickly be supplemented by a more, uh, a more rigorous and demanding ISO. Uh, working together with an accredited body, 
uh, will help people through the process. And I've convinced it will be worth the effort for people who really want to go the extra mile. In, in my business, we have uh, three or four ISOs. And I, and I can say, although it's taken quite a bit of time and effort to get the ISO, it makes a real difference. It makes us stand head and shoulders above in the field. And I think if you're looking for credibility, clarity and confidence, it will help grow funding uh, rather than shrink funding. So just a couple of final points. Our aim is not to punish people for doing really good work with extra cost or burden, and it may not be for everybody. It's a way to improve the system overall and to reward and encourage impact and impactful actors. And to reiterate, it's all voluntary. It should also allow charities who are under siege at the moment for their operational costs to show that staff and administration is actually an investment in the business and an investment in good project work. Acceptable overheads come up time and time again, and it's time these were put to bed, I think. So these standards are no longer an idea. It's actually coming into practice. But I feel we need to go fast. We've captured the spirit of the moment. And there's a real groundswell of interest in the work we're doing in these very simple ideas uh, that demands, re really, at the moment, we don't lose momentum. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, Leonard. Leonard is the founder and editor-in-chief of Philanthropy H magazine. Uh, he's also behind the How to Do Good book, a collection of inspiring personal stories about making a difference in society. Written by past presidents, philanthropists, foundation heads, Hollywood celebs, and ordinary people doing extra extraordinary good in our world. Thank you very much. And you spoke about the uh, creating real impacts for beneficiaries. That's a, as a f uh, main feature, I think, of, of uh, also of uh, this peace forum. So we'll talk about that. Uh, uh, later, but I'd like now to um, uh, involve Patrick in the conversation. Um, Patrick is the president of the Open Society Foundations. Uh, prior to joining Open Society, he served as the U.S. ambassador to South Africa until 2016, and uh, he has extensive experience in presidential and congressional campa campaigns. Most recently, he served as a senior aide to President Barack Obama. Patrick, given your extensive experience as a labor movement and union organizer uh, before, uh, you're not a stranger to tension and conflict, of course. Um, what are your views on the current situations? Let's talk about the general uh, situations first before we uh, talk so about in details about uh, Leonard's project. So this is the how did we arrive here question. Yes. Uh, well, yes. thank you so very much for inviting me into this conversation. Thank you to everyone who's joined us uh, in this forum uh, and to those who are also uh, joining us uh, in the Internet over uh, the live stream. Uh, there, there are so many uh, things that I'd love uh, to raise, but I want to first uh, thank my uh, fellow esteemed panelists for his presentation of uh, a project that uh, requires uh, due consideration. Uh, I appreciate that you received an E for effort from uh, your teachers in school, but I want to say that civil society writ large and the NGOs that we are privileged through the Open Society Foundation to give grants to receive an E for excellence uh, for uh, their work uh, in the field that has uh, integrity, uh, that is well uh, regulated, uh, and that's made transformative uh, and seismic change uh, in the lives of those uh, that they uh, work with uh, and those that uh, they serve. The frame for this uh, discussion uh, is uh, closing of civic space for NGOs. I want to just caution all of us when we're having this conversation today and when we think about this challenge uh, as we move beyond uh, this uh, arena here uh, in Paris. The challenge really isn't about closing space for NGOs. Uh, I would not be here uh, in this debate if it was just about uh, uh, keeping a number of uh, nonprofit organizations uh, alive. Uh, by civil space, we really need to be talking about uh, activists, uh, academics, labor unions, religious organizations, business groups as well, not just regulated uh, NGOs under various tax codes. The, the problem that we're discussing is neither uh, new uh, nor is it a short-term phenomena. It actually stretches back uh, over a decade, but it's in the last three to five years that we've seen a kind of crystallization of a particular 
uh, authoritarian uh, approach, which is uh, insidious uh, and seems to be spreading uh, like some uh, kind of uh, cancer. Uh, it's also uh, uh, the, re the result of a number of disparate events that have occurred uh, in the world, or what uh, Carnegie Endowment scholar Tom Carruthers would call a tectonic shift uh, in our politics. If you go back to the color revolutions in Serbia, uh, in, in uh, Georgia, uh, and then you couple that uh, with um, uh, the disruptions of uh, the Arab Spring, uh, there's a way in which authoritarian elites have had reason to be quite concerned about uh, loss of power and, to be blunt, the effectiveness of civil society, the effectiveness of the very NGOs uh, that we are uh, having a conversation about um, uh, regulating. Uh, it's, it's that uh, effectiveness that has created a kind of fear uh, and a response at a time when we live in one of the most contentious eras in history. If you look at the period, the three-year period, from 2010 to 2013, there were more acts of civil mobilization uh, and peaceful political uh, disruption than in, than in the entire decade of the 1990s. I remember when I served uh, in South Africa uh, and I had conversations with, um, let's just say, some authoritarians that had a, uh, some, clep some kleptocrats who were in power. They were constantly saying, you know, we are concerned about the foreign NGOs because we don't want our own Arab Spring here. So for them, uh, it was about the resolution of a particular kind of power uh, that was centered uh, in uh, their hands. So as we have uh, this conversation, as we consider uh, the challenge uh, before us, let's just be really careful about offering up solutions that might suggest that uh, the problem is with NGOs and civil society uh, and not with authoritarians. The reason why activism is imperiled uh, in Russia is not because NGOs lack transparency. The reason why civil society is closing off uh, in uh, Turkey right now is not because NGOs uh, lack credible boards of governance. Uh, in Nicaragua, the issue uh, is uh, not about how NGOs are regulated, but how students are being fired upon and prosecutors are being jailed. So I just think that it's important for us to elevate, uh, focus properly on the challenge uh, in order to uh, surface uh, uh, prescriptions that will be meaningful uh, in this uh, dis disorienting uh, era that we find ourselves in. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very well said, Patrick. And uh, it actually gives me a very uh, perfect leeway into Mr. Mo Ibrahim. Yeah, he's the one of the founding members of the Paris Peace Forum. So he's uh, the reason why we're here, <laughs> one of the reasons. Uh, he's also named as uh, 100 Most Influential People by Time Magazine in 2008. And he, a year before that, uh, you initiated the Mo Ibrahim Prize for Achievement in African Leadership, which awards a $5 million initial payment and a $200,000 annual payment for life to African heads of state who deliver security, health, education, and economic development to their constituents and would not uh, stay for life in power. Um, so I found that very fascinating, you know, that uh, uh, while many NGOs are sometimes operating at the mercy of the governments, you actually rewrote the rules. You try to uh, engage governments in different ways, and I can uh, agree more with Patrick that the problem uh, might not be with the civil society, but could be with the government. So giving them incentives to deliver good governors, I think, is quite uh, ingenious. So do you mind to elaborate more on that? Uh, has anyone taken the bait? <laughs> Well, uh, thank you very much, and uh, we are delighted to be here and uh, to see that uh, uh, the Paris Peace Forum, uh, Forum really uh, had a great start, and we look forward for uh, further development. Uh, right, I, we, we do work in Africa mainly. I'm an African, and uh, we decided really, uh, as I'm uh, sort of retiring almost, uh, I really focus on the issues in Africa. And for us, really, we think uh, Africa is a very rich continent. Uh, but as Mandela used to say, it's a rich continent, but poor people. And that's an interesting point. Why rich continent? Why poor people? And uh, the answer, I think, in our view, uh, it is a poor governance and the poor le leadership. There's no reason 
for African to be poor. Uh, Africa as a continent is very huge, very huge. The African population actually is very small. Africans are less than Indian, smaller, less than you guys, less than the Chinese, yeah? And, uh, but we have a land which swallows India, China, Europe, America, and even more than that. We have much more resources than you guys have. So why are we poor? And there's no answer to that except the poor governance and leadership. That's what we need to sort out. Yes, we realize we had a bad history, tough one, from slavery to colonialism and Cold War was also a problem for us. But that's finished now, and we need really to, to sort our stuff. Uh, we start by the issue of governance. We say, OK, what is governance? We need to define governance. And that's how we came with the idea of the uh, governance index. We sought to define governance in a very simple term. We think governance is really based in four basic uh, uh, issues, really. One is the rule of law. Rule of law and safety and security of people. This is a basic requirement from any government to deliver. Rule of law is not just about writing a, a decent book or, or, or a set of regulations or laws. It's about how the police behave, the judiciary, the independence of the judiciary. Uh, poor people, do they have access to court? Uh, you know, they suffer injustice. Can go and sort it out, and sort it out quickly before they die. And uh, our kids, are they safe to walk in the streets? Yeah? Uh, our daughters, can be they, you know, rape is a problem. Uh, violence. Uh, so all that comes under uh, really the issue of rule. Nobody, nobody can deliver that other than the government. So that's a government responsibility. Then the issue of the human development, health, education, etc., and welfare. The government is responsible for either delivering or facilitating the delivery of this service. Uh, then we have the economic peace, the, the sustainable economic development, uh, roads, airports, uh, electricity, clean water, all these arteries of industry, commerce, and economic life, unemployment, uh, management of public finance, how they're managing our public finance issue. Uh, then transparency, of course, and corruption, etc. Then there is soft area, human rights, and uh, 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 participation of people. In uh, we don't think democracy is just about voting every four years. It is how we participate in the running of our affairs, from a small village to a small town, everywhere. Because as citizens, we need to be part of all this. Uh, 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 processes. So we measure over 100 parameters in each country in Africa, and we publish the index every year. We make it available to everybody. We have a data portal. We encourage people to go there and to see how each country is performing. And more important, what's the trajectory of each country? We have this data now for 12 years. And you can see what is happening on rule of law in Cameroon, uh, what's happening on the economic development on South Africa, what is participation like in Nigeria, etc. And uh, uh, that gives us a scorecard for each country what's happening. We give it to civil society, we give it to the governments, we give it to parliaments, because the universities, because people doing research work, what's the relationship? I mean, we find, for example, a very strong correlation between uh, transparency uh, and, and, and economic prosperity. Mm. It's very interesting. Uh, so people need to think about that. Uh, you know, what's the effect of corruption on your economic future? Uh, so uh, we give all this data to all those people. It's free of charge is, is available. And I think that's the most important work uh, we do because we want the conversation between citizens and governments to be based on facts, okay? Not on slogans and uh, um, 
jumping around, dancing, or whatever some of our leaders get engaged is. But based on performance, <coughs> everybody, everybody, everybody sitting here, at some point, somebody will come at the end of the year, evaluate your performance. We all go through this. Why not governments? We need to be able to evaluate the performance of each government based on the data. What happened in the last year? How many kids were able to get to schools? How many hospital beds? How many, what happened to jobs? What happened to, and all this is, that's your performance. We and then we make this Britain, available. Though. Sorry? You have to do it in Britain. Absolutely, absolutely. If you had that in Britain, you didn't have Brexit. <laughs> uh, but because it's the lack of data, it's the lack of information to people who make them go and make stupid decisions or go and vote the wrong way. That's why we're trying to have a clear transparency in this issue. And that becomes the base in discussion between the various uh, 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 stakeholders there. So that is, as for the prize, leadership is also important. And leadership is different. And what we need leaders who are able to make the tough decisions in order to move forward to give the example in themselves. That's why we think if a leader comes to a country and moves the country forward, take a million, two million people out of poverty, uh, provide health, education, etc., to their people, and live peacefully in time, no this messing around with constitutions and uh, president for life, all that stuff, because it doesn't work. We think that is a hero. And we have a number of years in Africa. Unfortunately, uh, the international media don't recognize them. I mean, let me have a simple test for the people sitting here. And I see there are a lot of Africans sitting here. Everybody knows uh, Mobutu. Please raise your hands. Come on, don't be shy. Anybody knows Idi Amin? Raise your hand. Okay? People who know Fistas Mukhai, raise your hands. Four, five people. People who know Bohama, raise your hands. Four people, two people from our foundation. <laughs> Should not be counted. <laughs> Uh, I think the point is clear. We all know the villains, the bad African leaders. What, people I mentioned to you are great African leaders. For, you know, Festus Mohai was the leader of Botswana. He takes this country forward, the only African country to manage its resources for the benefit of the people. Leave with clean hands, uh, and we don't know our heroes. We Africans don't know our heroes. You only know our criminals. Is that right? We need to get these guys out of the shadow and say, hey, we have role models here. And because they are clean people, after they leave office, where do they go? European leaders, after they leave office, they go to the board of the banks, they go to the borders of, of the hedge funds, uh, everywhere, yeah? They make money, actually, after they leave office, right? Where Afri good African leaders go after they leave office? Nowhere. Some of them cannot afford to buy an apartment in their own capitals. You know these facts. That is the problem of being a good leader. Because you did not take money from people, you don't have a good pension, what do you do? You have to go and work, find a job, go and teach at university. We say, no, 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 no. We're going to look after your financial issues, but you go now and work in the civil society. Go lecture, go and meet the students in the schools and tell them what is it to be a good leader. Give the example, work on the peace process, go on the reconciliation. So Shisano has been working in Madagascar, Mukhai working in, in Congo, this guy working in Kenya, trying to produce, you know, to introduce peace. Uh, so this 
we're trying to bring these people out of the shadows, yeah. enable them to continue uh, to do this uh, uh, work. We had five or six winners over the last 10 years, which is a great achievement. Yeah. Some years we withhold the prize because there's no winner, and we need to have the guts to stand and say there's no winner this year. So it's not a pension, okay? So anyway, that's what we're trying to do. Okay, thank you. Thank that's, you. I think that's a wonderful idea. You know, a scorecard, a scorecard for government, I think that's something that the grassroots would be interested in. And with that, you know, I'd like to um, invite uh, Ms. Tini Soni. She's the CEO of the Aga Khan Foundation in India, a leading initiative across the thematic sectors of education, early childhood development, health and nutrition, economic inclusion, and agriculture development. And also... Um, help creating and building the capacity of community institutions to actively participate and subsequently take over development interventions is at the core of uh, all the AKF in interventions. Um, so, uh, Ms. Sonny, as someone who works extensively at the grassroots, how do you see the interplay between the shrinking space and the, the effect it has on the, uh, on the needs of the community and how, you know, the, the scorecards also, how do you, how do you factor that in into all these uh, dynamics. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Yeni, and it's really an honor to be here uh, with everyone. Thank you for everyone who's uh, here to attend the session. Um, I'd rather uh, uh, try, you know, use this opportunity to actually affirm the very critical and important role that civil society plays. Uh, in our work, we speak about the three pillars of development. We say the sustainable development is possible if there is a role for the public, for the government, for the private sector, and very importantly, for civil society. We also look at civil society at different levels, right down to the grassroots, that is, community institutions. They are, in a way, the first rung of civil society. They go out of their way to actually plan for their own village uh, development and uh, take their communities forward. So rather than uh, thinking that civil society is only the registered non-governmental organizations, as Patrick said, there are many levels of civil society that we should look uh, uh, to and from the grassroots upwards. Mm -hmm. I also feel it is time for us actually to also recognize an evolving role for civil society, perhaps uh, the need to go back to the grassroots, to the key and the core constituents, uh, the communities that we are there to serve and understand what their real priorities are rather than looking more externally where grant funding is coming from or you know uh, what proposals need to be written, but what are the needs and priorities of the communities at the ground. Uh, we do see a, a, a struggle in terms of financial sustainability and therefore perhaps it is time now also to look at alternative models of financing. Uh, could it be that uh, in a lot of our work, uh, the communities contribute for the work, either by way of their labor, so if, say, a water uh, a harvesting structure has to be built in a village, communities come forward and contribute their labor. We work with very poor communities, so there's not uh, that much money going around, but they definitely do contribute their labor, sometimes their kind. That builds that ownership. That builds the, um, uh, uh, you know, that it is our own asset and the future maintenance of that asset and therefore sustainability is then inbuilt. So I think these could be some of the uh, approaches going forward in this evolving role for civil society and the clear recognition that civil society has a very, very important role in the path of development. I would also like to say that partnerships are critical in this, uh, 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 in our work going forward. Often we compete too much and I think we need to collaborate much more. We need to dialogue uh, much uh, stronger and uh, together evolve a path going forward. So I would like to put out that partnerships must be the way forward for civil society. Uh, in my country, I have seen very strong civil society. I've also seen the government actually taking a lot of the work that civil society organizations have done and taking that to scale. An example that I could give is the women's self-help groups that civil society organizations in my country uh, uh, did a lot of work around. That has now become a national program by the government. The government is now taking it to scale. So I think also advising the government on what works and what does not. 
innovating. These are some of the roles that I would put for civil society organizations. Okay, uh, uh, you mentioned something about the private sector involvement. And so this is where Antoine uh, comes in. Uh, you worked for French Bankers Association, Credit Mutuel, Paribas, as well as BNP Paribas. And after retiring, you retired before, right, to pursue your passion in cinema and Hollywood, even wrote a book, La Cité de Femme. Is that correct? La yeah. Cité de Femme, okay. Last year, um, you were appointed as the executive committee and head of company engagement at BNP Paribas. Okay, Antoine, the, um, the bank, uh, the bank manifesto actually states that no country, business, or individuals can win in a world that loses. And collective progress can only be achieved through growth that is both equitable and sustainable. How do you translate that into an engagement with the NGO? Uh, I be, first of all, uh, uh, I'm very honored to be uh, there, to be there uh, besides true uh, philanthropes and, be and be with people who, has been, uh, who have been engaging with uh, NGOs uh, uh, for long. Uh, I believe that uh, having uh, uh, public uh, corporates uh, in the conversation is probably uh, something which is uh, relatively new. Uh, but which can probably uh, bring a lot of uh, interest. First of all, uh, there are more and more uh, companies that have very high uh, CSR standards. And in those CSR standards, you have uh, human rights standards. Uh, and you have standards about uh, freedom, you have uh, standards that uh, at the end of the day uh, can make the, the, the companies that have the, the highest uh, uh, CSR standards uh, very important partners uh, of the NGOs because when they uh, act in their uh, global uh, business, uh, they can really uh, uh, use those standards uh, to do exactly uh, the same thing uh, as uh, NGOs, which is uh, bringing uh, progress and which is uh, having uh, uh, situations uh, and human rights situations uh, that get uh, improving. So it's very important to, to have this in mind because I, I believe that uh, uh, we were not, uh, in the past, we were not at the table uh, uh, I would say uh, uh, com cor corporate were not expected uh, in this conversation and uh, I believe it is time to, to turn the table uh, and to have uh, the business uh, a real player uh, in helping uh, more uh, human rights uh, and better standards. And if we do this, uh, probably we, will, we were not that much uh, expected uh, there, but uh, I can see that in the reality this is something we are doing more and more. Uh, we can uh, work with gender equality standards, we can work with uh, human rights standards, and at the end of the day, our partners and the governments also where our uh, partners are located uh, start to understand this more and more. And if there Uh, to the funding. It's clear that the, shr sh the shrinking space is also a shrinking a money space. So we will not, uh, 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 as corporates, we will not uh, completely change the situation. Uh, we can only be part uh, of the answer. Of course, uh, we have, uh, we can uh, do a classical uh, uh, philanthropy. For example, at BNP Paribas, we have the oldest uh, corporate foundation uh, in France, uh, and we do uh, a lot uh, on uh, uh, social uh, inclusion, and we do a lot for uh, uh, refugees. But uh, we, we believe that if we want the corporate world uh, to be uh, less shy, uh, we need to find new solutions. Uh, among those new solutions, there are certainly uh, partnering on causes with our clients and our employees. 
For example, for the refugee, the refugee issue is a very interesting issue. It's uh, in the beginning, it was not very. Uh, there were no, there were not that many companies, that many corporates that would uh, 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 engage with uh, NGOs uh, for the the refugee issues. Uh, and it took, in 2013, we started. We created uh, uh, what we call uh, the. Uh, Emergency and Development Fund, which is a fund uh, where we will uh, match uh, the donations uh, of our employees and our clients for NGOs which are dealing with urgent uh, and, uh, and war uh, situations. And because we got very uh, good reception from our uh, uh, employees and clients, we then felt empowered to do more uh, and to have bigger plans uh, for uh, refugees uh, and, and, and to fund uh, NGOs and to be uh, an important partner of, uh, of uh, NGOs uh, like uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, CARE, uh, or, uh, or uh, La Croix Rouge. Uh, so this is uh, uh, one uh, element. Another thing, which is very, uh, uh, a real experiment for the moment, but I believe it can uh, bring uh, solutions is in creating uh, platforms uh, that will uh, uh, certainly use uh, such uh, initiative as Leonard Stoll uh, initiative or as uh, 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 Mo Ibrahim's uh, uh, data uh, is uh, creating platforms that will advise people, for example, our clients, on their uh, impact. And if we do this, uh, it will encourage them to uh, do more private philanthropy because we will use all the standards existing on the market and provide them very uh, usable uh, tools uh, that will help them to know that if they are doing this, they will have real impact. Because of course, the real issue is not the number of water pumps, it's not the number of... Uh, the, the, the real issue is the, the real impact we can uh, uh, provide, and it's very important to have uh, uh, such uh, 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 tools. And finally, uh, and, uh, and I would uh, uh, um, rebound on things that have been uh, al already uh, uh, said, uh, there, is, uh, there are alternative uh, sources uh, of finance, financing and uh, engaging uh, NGOs. For example, in uh, uh, India and here in uh, Indonesia, uh, we are uh, trying uh, to bring uh, private capital, such as uh, in, uh, pension fund capital, for example, to projects that have been designed by NGOs uh, or by UN environment, and we help to make uh, those program uh, uh, efficient, in fact, impactful. Uh, we help to have those programs uh, providing funding to small farmers that will uh, act uh, uh, with, uh, uh, I would say, respecting uh, rules uh, uh, on uh, labor, uh, rules on uh, ecology. Uh, and we also, and the, 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 the goal is to provide them the means to do that. Because if you tell them to respect uh, this and you don't give them the mean to do this, it's, uh, it's pointless. So we, we try to, to do this. And, and so we believe in coalitions. We believe that working with, uh, you can have systems. Even we can work with an NGO uh, that criticizes us. Uh, we, uh, uh, we have examples uh, where in some places in the world, uh, we, we collaborate to programs uh, of NGO that can, uh, uh, on a, a for other reason, uh, have a criticism, uh, but the the fact, but we also uh, do a due diligence of the NGOs before working with them. So we are all engaged in a in a process of mutual uh, um, uh, progress. And because I uh, we are uh, always doing new partnership, I just want to do one uh, uh, announcement: is that uh, you know that uh, uh, Forest We Take Care uh, has created created uh, um, a development uh, and peace uh, initiative. Uh, and uh, we have decided to uh, create a new kind of coalition uh, when a partner, uh, as a, a while uh, by, sorry, by partnering with him in uh, uh, 
developed countries where there are problems of creating peace like in California or in uh, uh, countries in a country like South Africa where he has a, uh, a program uh, uh, as well and he's also in South Sudan but the new program we are going is in uh, is in South Africa yeah thank you very thank much you. Thank you. I think you look like you're itching to. Yeah, I, I am. Mean, just I am. Go I'm, ahead. I'm, yeah. I'm itching to jump in just to say that I that I um, uh, having participated in many conversations about shrinking uh, civic space. I just want to applaud uh, the Peace Forum for having BNP on this stage playing this role, and want to applaud BNP for uh, the contribution that it's uh, making. Consider this for one moment. Last year, uh, if you consider. All of the investments that were made through NGOs, through private philanthropy, that totaled about $40 billion across the globe. That sounds significant, but you understand that it is merely a speck when you understand that in the same uh, global fiscal year, there were $1 trillion, $400 billion worth of transnational investments from companies. And uh, uh, regrettably, regrettably, far too often, those resources go into locking in a kind of centralization uh, of uh, authority in restrictive spaces. I know from my time uh, having served in government uh, that um, uh, it's one thing to have civic activists on the steps of uh, City Hall clamoring for inclusion. It's another thing altogether when the uh, CEO of, of, of BNP uh, is engaged in uh, public philanthropy or uh, if a CEO of an automobile industry in, let's say, oh, Hungary, uh, suggest to um, the Prime Minister uh, that perhaps um, uh, it's not to their benefit to close off civic space, or if the CEO of a telecommunications company in the Congo uh, has a conversation with uh, the President to say this is perhaps not the direction to go. Corporations need to appreciate that closing civic space uh, leads to uh, obvious uh, corruption, but also to a disruption of rule of law, which they are dependent upon. So I just want to applaud BNP and agitate for more of this kind of uh, entry. Thank you, Patrick. Um, but we're actually seeing uh, two different trajectories now. I mean, you spoke about, uh, uh, you know, not a uh, shrinking space, but uh, for China, in, in China, for example, they just recently introduced a regulation that essentially uh, tried to regulate and suppress the movement of civil society organizations, especially the international organizations. But at the same time, we're seeing a flourishing, increasing number of NGOs operating in China. So how are you seeing this? this what, what kind of, uh, you know, how do you see these phenomena? How do you see this in the future? What, what are these two different trajectories? What does it mean? So anyone would like to take that question? So I think it's the, uh, it's the focus on, say, indigenous civil society building from internally from within the country. And I think that can be a very powerful uh, movement for good when you have community institutions federating, coming together, and working towards good of the larger community. So I would say that that, was, that would be positive. You needn't always have, say, large grants coming in from, uh, you know, from external sources. But you can also look at internal uh, philanthropy. You can also look at internal civil society building as a movement going forward. I'll say just a couple of things. I think I read a, an OECD figure, and, and I'm sure you'll put, put me right on this if, if, I'm not, if I'm not right, but I think it was 97 uh, governments are, have either got restrictive legislation or are considering restrictive legislation that will uh, get in the way of philanthropic capital flows. Yeah. Now, now that's clearly a big issue. Uh, that, that, that's, that's, that's clearly a big issue, but you know, I see a, a an increasing role, and, and we've talked about shrinking spaces, I see a, an increasing role for philanthropy uh, and for the wealth that is being created uh, and for new forms of giving. So actually shrinking spaces, yes, in governmental terms who are starting to clamp down, but actually there's op real opportunity as well for us to take new methods of giving and uh, the new wealth that's being created and do good with it. It just needs to be uh, well managed and, and governed and transparent and, and, and you know, we've got a fund for impact and we've got a fund for the customers who are beneficiaries. So as long as you're giving out money, you're fine, but once you start criticizing the government, that is a different story. So maybe Dr. Ibrahim, would yeah, you like to uh, respond to that? Uh, actually, the problem is uh, very well manifested in, in Africa more than in Europe, although we can see even in Europe, 
uh, we see what happened to the Open Society University in Hungary, in the heart of the European Union, uh, when those guys have to close or migrate the university because of the funny antics of Mosar Oriban. But okay. Uh, so uh, what we see in Africa actually is a, a tendency to pass laws in order to strangle uh, civil society. And I found that quite, uh, you know what they say, typically, uh, you guys receive money from abroad, and that makes you foreign agents. You are not patriotic. You are executing agendas of foreigners in the country. So we, as such, we should treat you as agents of foreign powers, and we should not allow this to happen. And look at how ridiculous this argument is when I cannot go into any uh, a hotel in, in Western Europe or in the United States without bumping into an African president who is coming asking for money. So why is this fine for African presidents to come to Europe or to America asking for money from foreign powers and... Mo, Mo, Mo and I, I, I had, I, I, you know, I won't, I won't name names, but uh, I had this experience when uh, I was in a meeting uh, in Addis uh, in the uh, African Union headquarters, which was built by China. By China. Uh, and someone was asking me, someone with authority, uh, about uh, the foreign flow of uh, support uh, for uh, international philanthropy uh, to NGOs. I uh, did not hesitate to point out uh, the irony and to talk about the very same disparity uh, that you're uh, naming right now. But sometimes I wonder, Mo, whether or not um, uh, that, uh, that irony uh, might not be used to the advantage of NGOs and uh, civil society. I can think, for instance, of uh, for the Open Society uh, in, in Russia, where uh, uh, as a consequence of our special relationship with Vladimir Putin, uh, we are no longer uh, allowed uh, to be present. But our local uh, foundation in uh, Kazakhstan, for instance, continues to do important work and to thrive, has a local uh, advisory board, staff that make their decisions on the ground about uh, local grants that are not simply in the education and humanitarian uh, space, uh, but also uh, in spaces that might be considered polit political philanthropy as well. So the more these accusations are made, the more it compels us all to kind of dig into and lean into our local authenticity, which I think goes to uh, your uh, very point about some of the metrics that you'd like to... Yeah, but advance. at least I understand the Putin position. I don't sympathize with it, but I understand it because he is cut off also. No, I'm going to start from, worrying from about the, you if you understand it. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's also cut off from American assistance or uh, the, the international uh, money market. So, fair enough, at least we understand he's completely isolated there. But our African leaders, I mean, I just cannot understand uh, 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 that position. And the only explanation is that uh, they just don't like to be criticize. They don't like to be, and we try to point out, civil society is not there to criticize governments. We are there to help governments. And if they do something great, we're going to be the first to upload them. If they're doing something bad, we'll try to point it out to them early enough so they, they stop doing it before it becomes a problem. So as such, we are there to help governments execute its duty in delivering the services, etc. And uh, so it's so stupid to really treat them as an element. However, I, I need to bind, to, if I have just a, an extra minute, uh, there's another side for the conversation which is only important to highlight. I was talking to an African leader who is, I quite respect actually, uh, a little bit authoritarian, and uh, at some stage, and I said to him, uh, you had a very good, I know you're not a thief. You are not stealing money. Uh, we have a good uh, development program, etc. But why your people are beating up the students in the street? And why, 
And he said to me that actually this leader is no longer around, so this, that's why I'm not mentioning his name. Anyway, he said, uh, those are not civil society. These are more political opponents. And what they're doing is they go and form uh, NGOs or whatever, and under the banner of NGO, they want to organize marches and protests, etc. But they are my political opponent. That raised two questions immediately. One question to him was, maybe because you are closing the political space, the guys want to work in politics. They can no longer work in politics. So they go to the NGOs to try to work through that. So there's maybe something for you there. But also to raise a question for civil society. Is civil society a party political? It shouldn't be. We always say civil society should act as an ambulance in the time of war. You should have a big red cross or red crescent on top of your car so you can move between the warring uh, parties without anybody shooting at you because you are not there, you are not siding with any uh, party. So that is important for our uh, civil society organization also to watch. That is the reason, actually, we are in conversation uh, for a year now with a number of African uh, foundations uh, to develop a charter for the African foundations to make it clear how we should operate as such. We are not a political party. We are not supporting any political parties. We shouldn't. If you want to do it, go and join the political parties. But we are there to work in society as a whole, and we'll do our duty there without being partisan. That enables us to move more freely. But this also needs to be explained to the African leaders to stop taking shots at the civil society. So I just wanted to draw uh, a whole uh, picture of what's happening. What you're doing is very important. We have been also in conversation with a number. Some NGOs came to us to complain, like some in Kenya a couple of years ago were in Kenya, and uh, some NGOs told us that the government is closing us down. So we went to Uhuru, President Uhuru, and said, OK, why are you closing those guys down? And he said, oh, for three years, they never submitted their accounts. And what if the charities were in London, what the Charity Commission will do? We'll, close, we'll take them to, to court. And so we also have to behave at NGOs. It doesn't mean that we're an NGO, we are above the law. We also need to have governance and we have to proper uh, 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 you know, systems in the way we elect our officers, the elections, the sure. transparency, sure. Sure. budgets. Sure. Sure. Well, we need to do that. NGOs have absolutely no power and authority. I mean, let's let's be real about the asy the asymmetry here. And 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 and, and, I, and you know, I defer to the moderator because there are so many that we have to get into this conversation. Mo, I'd agree with just about uh, everything you say, except except I, I disagree with the notion that uh, NGOs uh, exist to support. Uh, governments, uh, we th there is a point of contest. And they say we support the government. Well, but just to to to. No, no, uh, no. We are not. No, no. We criticize. I said we criticize, support or criticize or whatever. I, but, I, will, I will I will I will I will get you that Mo. But yeah. I but I think it's really important to acknowledge the asymmetries of power that we're that we're discussing here. Yes, uh, it's important for uh, NGOs to be uh, transparent. I'm proud that our foundation posts every single grant that we make in all 144 countries that we operate in uh, on our website. But in every space where we operate, NGOs already have local regulations that they uh, conform to. And there are protocols that, uh, uh, that uh, exist across regions. Patrick. Some of them are transnational as well that speak to the, the question of outcomes uh, and effectiveness. But, I, but, I, but let's just be really careful. Let's be really careful in um, presenting any of this in a way that suggests that NGOs are in some way at all to blame or complicit for uh, 
the environment of repression uh, against uh, the work of human rights uh, activists. Uh, yeah, and the that, that, that's not that, the, that's that's not what I say we, at all. We raise, but we raise both. We yeah, yeah, but the we are not of above course. the law. Of okay? course not. And of we need to, I know, we have to submit our accounts. We have to have our annual general meeting. We're certainly not above the law because, because the, every, everywhere need, I turn, human yeah. rights activists are being jailed. Yeah, yeah <laughs> so. because you don't need to give any reasons or weapons because you're going to use any of this to come back at you. Okay? And then when we're above the law, then we can go and shout and have our fight with the, uh, with the governments over that issue. But we also need to act properly. All right. Okay, can, I'm a very can, happy moderator because can, the conversation I, is very lively. Can I make But I just need to remind you all that we're going into the question and answer session from the audience. Can, can, can I just so make I think one, I, one point, one question Well, you will get, your, in, you'll get your chance uh, after we take the questions from the audience. But, <laughs> but yeah, a gentleman over there, one. Uh, okay. And uh, the lady over there. We just keep it two first. Go ahead. I'm an exile-based activist. I'm also from a rich country which has many oil and gas with poor population. But my question regarding the issues... Which country you are from? Azerbaijan. And uh, since we're, we have our independence last 27 years, our country received 160 billion oil incomes for the last 15 years. And more than 50 billions, 55 billion stolen by ruling regime. And according to the international media, recently many of you maybe read these issues with Danske Bank, uh, Azerbaijan and Landramat case, when between 2012 and 13, Estonian branch from Danske Bank, bigger Danish bank, which is with, from country with zero tolerance to corruption, launder Azerbaijani government three billions which is hundreds, dozens of millions spent for bribery, political bribery in Europe. And in many st European states now going public discussions. My question is to bank. What bank must be doing? Because as like civil society in Azerbaijan, we are lost all our hopes regarding the state donors like EU, American state departments, etc. Even for private donors like honestly with Soros, because I know, we understand now we have many problems with uh, uh, in Hungary, and you maybe you don't have time to concentrate also for small, teeny stuff regarding the Azerbaijan, but even before you make a lot of help for us. Questions to bank. We ask, when we lost all of the hopes, uh, civil society staying last four years like jobless people, many of our friends staying in the prison, my brothers in jail for defamation, for explosive corruptions, but my father called me today and said, well, can you send us $200? We don't have money to go in and give him goods in the prison. And the, I'm very well known internationally recognized human rights activist, even my family, but we have 160 political prisoners. And now we're calling to the bank, which is laundered 3 billion, which is already a criminal case investigated by FBI, by European Commission, Danish authorities, to say, for guys, you received 150 million profit from all of this laundering. Can you give this money back to civil society because we don't have any costs? And bank responded to us. Say for yes, we're looking about framework just to bring some kind of mechanisms to return this money. But we say, coming back to them again and say, guys, we want to, you are involved to this framework, not only bank industries, also international institutions, civil society. But bank, right now, they want to give this money back. We have also whistleblowers in the banks. They told for they think not returning this, they are already publicly promised returning this money back for good things. But they want to give this money for Danish charity to support some kind of environment issues. But we told them, give this money back to civil society to fight against corruptions, human rights support, and democracy promotions for our own nations, from state which is this money stolen. Thank you. So I, 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 I cannot give very documented answer on the Danske Bank uh, case because I, I don't know. Of course, I read the press like everybody, but not uh, much more. But the, the issue uh, that you are raising uh, is the issue of how uh, the business 
and the civil society and the financial system uh, at certain moment uh, can be uh, helping corruption uh, and how to repair the situation. So I believe that the way to avoid to have to repair the situation is to uh, try uh, not to be drowned uh, in this. In France, uh, we have now a law which is called the law of duty of care. Uh, and this law of uh, duty of care, uh, which uh, certainly uh, is creating uh, uh, important, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, activity in the bank. We need to have uh, uh, a lot of people and uh, vigilance uh, to uh, enforce it. But it's certainly, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's certainly no, now time that we are not only uh, following the anti-corruption laws, uh, we follow them, but that we also uh, really try to value and measure our impact uh, on the countries uh, where we operate or where our client operates. Uh, and, at, uh, and I believe that this law of duty of care uh, will, in a country uh, like France, uh, uh, avoid such situations. So I hope that such laws, I know that in England, you, uh, in UK, you have a law uh, which is not that far uh, from this, but which is probably more only uh, aimed for uh, labor conditions. Uh, but certainly, uh, we need uh, also, the, at certain moment, uh, the governments to help to make clear what are the, I would say, the obligations uh, of the of the business, and uh, and we believe that in France uh, we start to have uh, much improved legislation for this. Do you want to add your two cents on this? No, okay. All right, then I'll just go to the next. Uh, uh, hi, my name is Sarah, and I'm from Saxon Consultants. My question is to Mo Ibrahim. Uh, first of all, thank you for everything you've done for uh, African and the Af for encouraging the African leaders. We really appreciate that. So my question is basically based on, do you think there exists other sustainable um, approach or incentive to make African leaders leave uh, basically their position on time without them rely relying on your aid, for example, your incentive, um, something that is different than them waiting for you when they finish for you to basically pay them. Because it's important for us, no, for them to realize that this cannot be a dependence um, like trade, basically. Do you have any other alternative? Thank you. Yeah, you know, th thank you very much for the question. But I just want to correct something. Uh, our prize is not an incentive for people not to be corrupt, because you cannot compete with corruption money, because you can make billions of dollars out of corruption. What we give is peanuts compared to the amount of money they make. So it is not intended to that. It's given to people who would have been decent, whether there's a prize or not, because they are good people. There are people like that around who want to come and serve. It's not because they are, uh, there are bribes or no bribes. The bribes is really for us to recognize those people, for our kids to know we have good leaders. They are not all thieves. Some of our leaders are wonderful. We need to recognize that. I wish that the international community does help us in, in dealing with this problem of corruption and bad leadership. Why the international communities are not shunning those leaders who overstay their time, who are curbing human rights in their countries, who are falsifying elections, uh, who are killing other people, who are stealing money. Why those people, you can come and see them, you know, standing with, with, with our European leaders? Uh, why? Are our banking system is still allowing stolen money to be siphoned out of Africa and disappearing into thin air? Why is that? Okay? It is so ridiculous. If my cousin in Sudan 
uh, signed to me a letter and said, please, I need $5,000 to pay the school fees for my children. And I try to transfer $5,000. You know, it takes over a month because I receive letters from the banks uh, where this money is going, where you got the money from. I had to provide evidence that I have got money come from legitimate sources. And it takes one month to get $5,000 for me to my cousin. The Nigerian oil minister, which was arrested last year to stole $3 billion or something, how these banks took the $3 billion without asking a question? And the answer is, if you or me go and try to put $5,000 in the bank, they grill you. Where you got this money from, you have to prove. Yeah. You go with a billion dollar, they put the red carpet for you and offer you a drink. That is a problem. They also, you have the problem of these very strange structures, which is called trustee companies, anonymous companies, companies which nobody knows who own it. You know, they have some lawyers sitting, and nobody knows what's happening with it. Because if you are a president and you stole a couple of billion dollars, where are you going to put it? You don't go to the local Barclays Bank or Bean Barry Bass, you know, to deposit this money. Everybody in the city will know. You need to take it out of the country. And you need to clearly wipe any footprints. Then they go to this, uh, create these uh, anonymous companies. Nobody knows who is the owner, okay? Because they have lawyers as the trustees. They are the beneficial owners. And because the money, and we have been arguing and fighting why, why you need to have this beneficial can. Some some countries managed to 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 to, to ban this, or to publish not to ban it, publish a register of ownership. UK Cameron managed to, to do that. We were, were amazed that the United States refused to do it. The United States had a very strong record on fighting corruption. But when it came to anonymous companies, they refused to do it because of the lobby of the lawyers in Delaware. Because what we found actually, this, most of these companies are not in Panama or Paradise Island. Most of these companies are in the United States. And so what are you guys talking about? Where is, we need really a stand against all these issues from the international community. That's what we need. Mo, Mo okay. I, 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 want, I wonder, and, to, and to, bring the, to bring the conversation back around to the question of closing uh, civic space, I wonder if part of the answer to Sarah isn't just that we have to stop focusing on individual leaders uh, in Africa, but instead focused through the work and the investments that we make in partnership with civil society in building resilient institutions, independent media, independent judiciary, uh, a, a, a student class, a labor class that has the ability to interrogate and hold power to account. So I think that we have to move from individuals to uh, structural problems, systematic problems in lifting up resilient institutions. Well, oh, could you use your microphone? This is a systematic problem. And that the world governance structure needs really to evolve in order to help us deal with corruption. There's no way we're going to deal with corruption as long as our people are able to take their money and put it in the Western Bank, buy their lovely houses in Paris Absolutely. and villas in South France. I mean, we cannot, we, cannot, we cannot deal with it. Anyone wants an engaging conversation? Should invite these two for drinks later. OK. Um, you, sir. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, Brian Wilkie from Gulf for Good in Dubai. Um, we've, we're talking about the shrinking role of the NGOs and charities in society, but there seems to be a, a dichotomy here. That on the one hand, more and more people than ever before, especially young people, are engaging in charities and NGOs. But on the other hand, so many of them, the, 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 the NGOs themselves, are reporting that their funds are falling and it's more and more difficult to raise funds. 
And that seems to be because of a lack of trust that the money's actually going to go where it's intended to go. So there's a question here for Mr. Stahl and for the panel. Um, for Mr. Stahl, do you think this new code of practice and uh, standards initiative will help restore trust in the NGOs? And for the panel, how else do we restore trust? What more th can we do to raise funds so that more good can be done around the world? Thank you. Thank you. That, that, that is absolutely the aspiration of what we're setting out to achieve with this independent code. Uh, if we can close the trust gap and we can show donors, whoever they are, whether they're the public or, or, or government entities, that money is being well used with efficient, more efficient, better run uh, practice operations, uh, and that money's being used to fund real impact and being used for the benefit of beneficiaries, then that then that's good. And I think I think the funding pot will grow. I think it's. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a reward and an encouragement, uh, a reward to achieve a code and an encouragement for others to join it. So yes, I would absolutely agree that it can help fill the trust gap. Thank you. Any other part? Okay. Maybe uh, uh, one point uh, is also uh, uh, breaking the, the silos. I believe that uh, more and more projects uh, will be projects uh, where you can have around the table uh, uh, NGOs, uh, companies, uh, local governments, uh, and it's a way to restore trust. Uh, it's a way to restore mutual trust because, uh, uh, for example, we uh, in the business, we know that the NGOs are also wary of the people of the business and uh, and they are right uh, because uh, it's uh, uh, the interests that are followed by the people uh, of the business uh, are not the same so it's normal that there is a discussion uh, but uh, doing projects together uh, is certainly uh, a way uh, to uh, improve the to have the discussion and another thing is definitely uh, w w there is a digitalization uh, more and more decisions uh, will be taken uh, with the help of intelli artificial intelligence, uh, will be taken uh, with uh, uh, digital uh, platforms. And it's true that such standards, uh, as the ones mentioned that Leonard Stolz, uh, are uh, very good ingredients uh, for the, the, the di digital platforms uh, and for uh, artificial intelligence. There are other uh, ways also of uh, of developing this, uh, and certainly all the the I would say the cooperation that can come from NGO with those standards and with those uh, digital means, and a lot of uh, uh, NGOs are now doing a tremendous work uh, to uh, uh, be uh, adapted to the digital age. So I'm certainly, uh, uh, <laughs> but it's clear that it's the direction, and we will see uh, uh, a lot of differences. For example, we. Just to, 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 to give an example, uh, we have just created a, a, a platform which was made under the, the auspices of uh, a Grameen Lab of uh, uh, Professor Yunus. It's, it's Climate Seed. It's a, it's a platform to match uh, carbon offsetting projects and uh, uh, people uh, who uh, want to offset uh, carbon. And those projects actually are very often not only carbon projects, but they are development projects they are very often NGO uh, uh, projects. Uh, and it's clear that the, 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 the NGOs that will be uh, able to uh, uh, adapt and to submit projects to such platforms, the, if we have good standards, uh, standards can be an element of trust. And this can change the landscape. It will not change completely the situation of funding of the NGOs. We need to all uh, have uh, uh, our goodwill in this because uh, there is no only one solution. It's a huge problem, so there is no only one solution, but it can help. Look, I, I, th I think one other thing there, it's a, it's a pathway to better uh, accountability. Um, and I think publishing it in multiple languages will also make it really very accessible to a lot of organizations around the world. Clearly, there are some A-grade organizations doing their own governments, governance, doing a fantastic job, but that's not everybody. There's, there's big holes in our system. Okay, thank you. So, uh, we're running out of time, but uh, I'd like to invite that lady over there to ask the question, short and sweet if possible. But then I will. Um
also another question on top of her question, and then I will ask the panelists to answer the questions also, by, also while delivering your final remarks, each of you. So you all have two minutes also. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Maria Ivanova of the University of Massachusetts in Boston. And I'd like to turn to Mr. Mo Ibrahim and to Patrick Gaspar. Uh, we were inspired by your <coughs> index in Africa because it is a mirror to show countries how they're doing. We have created an environmental conventions index that measures the, the extent to which governments actually perform on the international commitments that they have for the environment. And the results are quite positive and quite puzzling. In Africa, the top, out of the top 10 performers on the Ramsar Convention in Wetlands in 2015, out of the top 10, eight are developing countries, four of them are in Africa. We have Mali, Uganda, Kenya, Egypt, doing extremely well on the conventions in Ramsar. So Your we question? have an accountability mechanism that inspires. Okay. How can we make governments deliver better on okay. what they have committed to? And how can we engage universities in Africa better in that way? Okay, hold on the, uh, to the answer because I'm going to add to one more question from the ads. Um, it's vital that we make a case for how opening civic space adds value to the governments and societies more broadly. How can we build a coalition of governments and civil society who stand for open civic space? So please, the floor is yours. Two minutes. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, anyone wants to take it first? Tilly, maybe you should uh, start. So I think dialogue is very essential. Uh, sorry, I forgot my mic. Yeah. So I think dialogue is very essential. Dialogue also requires that the partners are equal. So, you know, that understanding that it's not that civil society is coming from a space which is less than the space, say, for the public or the private sector. So I think equality and that dialogue is important. Among civil society, I think there is need for much greater partnership. And also an investment in generating evidence for what has worked on the ground and what has led to the greatest impact. I sometimes feel that we do not invest that much in generating that evidence. Uh, while having regulation is uh, 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 the way forward, we must have that. All sectors are regulated, so why not the uh, civil society space? But I think regulation should also take into account the context, the very local context of different countries. So uh, an overarching kind of a regulation must also have the ability to be contextualized to local conditions. Okay. So I would say uh, partnerships is the way forward, dialogue, is that uh, is the way that we should go? Okay. So, Leonard, how do you enlarge the space? Look, I'm going to pick up the index question. Um, Mo is a very humble guy, but he does extraordinary things, and I think the index and the prize. Um, you know, I, you said it, it didn't uh, reward and incentivize people, but actually, you know, I, d I don't agree with you. I think you, your, your prize and in, in the index, it, it does reward in the ranking terms, and it does give gentle encouragement to good people to do things better. And, you know, that's what we're actually trying to do with the standards for the charity sector. We, we, we want to set them on a pathway, a, a blueprint to do things better and with more accountability. It's very similar in many ways, and we've probably taken a lot of inspiration from you. But, um, you know, I, I, I think you're, you're being a little bit over humble, Mo, if you don't mind me saying. And, and, you know, if we can set people on a pathway to do things better and do things properly, then that's fantastic. Can you uh, okay. Uh, right, I'm, I'm really uh, grateful uh, because I haven't seen it. I would like uh, if you can let us know how to connect will be useful because we'd like to see that. Uh, that's very interesting. Uh, I think it's very important to really take a position and to call out the bullies. I mean, I, I was incensed when I heard the Tanzanian president uh, but <laughs> okay, we've got a Tanzanian there confirmed. <laughs> you know, uh, banning pregnant students from going to schools, then banning uh, an NGO doing family planning, and more buzzingly, in a country where fifty percent of the population earn less than two dollars a day. 
he stand up and he say, no, 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 we don't need those family planning people. And actually, I urge all Tanzanian women to have more children. And I say, excuse me, what, what exactly are you doing? Are you crazy? What is this? You cannot feed your own people. An average, on average, a Tanzanian woman have five children. You want her to have 10 children? How are you going to feed those people? How are you going to employ them? What are you going to do? And why are you ban? So it is this populist attitude, people closing, not only banning political rallies of the uh, other parties, but attacking civil society and silencing every voice in the country. We take them on. We, we need to stand up and say, excuse me, here's a red card. Right? We have to get these red cards in our pockets and go around and stand again. Is that international committees is invited to, to stand up. So we need to speak. Sometimes we are too polite, too nice. Oh, the nice guy, Tanzanians are good friends. Yeah, I have many Tanzanian friends. But it is for my Tanzanian friends, I have to stand up and say, excuse me, what you're doing is unacceptable. And I think people need to stand and show road cards to all those guys who are, are, are misbehaving. It's just we need to stand up. Thank you. Patrick? Let me, let me uh, first join in the acclaim of Mo uh, and his prize. I, I agree that there is a tremendous amount of uh, humility in how you present uh, the prize, Mo. But for all of us, what was uh, electrifying about the prize is that you forced all of us to ask a set of questions. If you're living in a space where someone's not winning the prize or not being considered for the prize, uh, it throws up uh, a real pall around the normalization of a particular kind of behavior. So it conditions uh, a set of questions and, uh, and new norms. And I think for that, it was transformative uh, and absolutely uh, brilliant. Uh, to the question and to the, the final points here, just want to uh, very quickly say that uh, even though uh, our general frame, there's some pessimism uh, to it. Uh, there are so many places uh, around the globe where we're seeing signs of tremendous uh, progress. One of the questioners mentioned the young people who are involved now with NGOs who had never been involved uh, before. We're seeing that kind of surge in every region that we all uh, are active in uh, around the world. I also want to say that uh, we're seeing some great solutions from NGOs, from civil society that has been uh, under assault. We're seeing ways in which all of us are moving away from the accusation of being rootless cosmopolitans by thinking globally, but acting locally. I'm thinking here of uh, HCLU, uh, HCLU, a human rights uh, organization in uh, Hungary that uh, managed to take the accusations uh, against them, that they were foreign uh, agents, and instead humanized their efforts, their staff, their advisory boards, and those who, on whose behalf they were specifically working for in a very real tale way that spoke to neighbors in urban and rural parts uh, of uh, Hungary. Uh, I think it's also important to uh, your point, uh, to make certain that we're all working uh, collaboratively uh, with strategy. Between 2013 and 2015 in Kenya, there were four attempts to uh, surface NGO laws that would have closed off civic space. But because of the coming together of civil society and business and labor and clergy, they were able to turn uh, back those efforts because they understood that we could all succeed together or hang separately. Lastly, uh, I'll say that it's terrible important since we are at the Paris Peace Forum and there are multinational organizations here and uh, uh, institutions of regional governance, uh, it's important that we all extend a halo of protection uh, to civil society. This is an example. I recall when um, uh, um, uh, the UN uh, Secretary, uh, I'm sorry, the U.S. Ambassador uh, to um, uh, the United Nations, Samantha Powers. I remember when she was in that role and she created an index of women that were being held uh, as political prisoners around the world. And she had a persistent, consistent naming and shaming that some uh, took exception to, but it moved the needle forward on rights in a way that civil society groups in uh, those countries could not. So extending that halo of protection uh, is usually necessary and something that we have to ask uh, our collaborators uh, to do. Thank you so much for uh, having you. us here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Antoine? 
So no, n not a lot to add, but uh, we can see that we have uh, to build uh, a lot of coalition between uh, several actors and uh, uh, probably two things. One thing is that we have to build the coalition, nevertheless, the wha uh, who is the initiator. Sometimes the initiator can be uh, an NGO, sometimes it can be an international organization, sometimes it can be a corporate uh, and what is uh, whatever uh, is the initiator it's in, we can see that the, the good ideas sometimes the best ideas comes from the NGO sometimes uh, it comes uh, from uh, international organization and sometimes it can, it can come uh, from a, a generous person working uh, in a in a corporate so what is is very important is that we we real co-construct uh, 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 with no regard to where the idea uh, is uh, uh, coming and how we can blend uh, goodwill uh, to uh, build good solution. And this certainly applies to research because uh, a lot of NGOs are doing research to find new solutions. A lot of banks are doing research. Uh, a lot of international organizations are doing it. For example, uh, when uh, Satya Tripathi from the uh, UNEP uh, asks uh, to uh, 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 WWF, BNP Paribas, the Indonesian government uh, to work together in Indonesia. It's really uh, something that moves the boundaries. In this case, it's the international organization. In another case, it can be maybe somewhere, somewhere else. But it's very interesting. It's very important uh, to have uh, all those kind of organization blending their research to find new solutions. Thank you so much. And I think uh, with that, that's uh, perfect, Antoine, because we're running out of time. I'm not going to conclude because uh, I think you all have said, uh, uh, you know, what needs to be said. And uh, let's just give all of our wonderful speakers a warm round of uh, applause. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.